So, just in case you aren't aware of us, uh, we are the International Centre for Guidance Studies, often short, shortened to ISEGS, and we are a research centre based at the University of Derby. We specialise in career and career development, and also undertake research and, and, and consultancy on a range of, of sort of associated subjects in the area of kind of education, progression, career development, and so on. We currently have eight eight members of staff and, uh, and 50 associates, or over, in fact over 50 associates. Oh, just Actually some of us have just come from an associate meeting. Uh, if you are interested in finding out more about the associate network then please uh, get in touch with us and probably talk to Siobhan as, as she's really in charge of the associate network. Uh, we're based here within the School of Education and we have a close working relationship with, with the School of Education but also with a number of the other uh, departments within the, within the university, including the business school. And so, on. so this year we've had quite an, quite an exciting year. Almost every year with ISEX is, is quite exciting. I've discovered uh, it's always a roller coaster. But this year we've we've had we've had some new staff. Uh, Emma, who's sitting at the back, I won't embarrass her by making her stand up. It's a, a new researcher. Um, we've also had a number of new associates join us this year. Um, and we've had some new doctoral students, some of whom are in the room again. Uh, so far we have produced 22 publications this year, and I think we've possibly brought out another one this morning. Um, and, and we have others still to come before we're done, I think. Uh, before Christmas there will be, be more. So we've been pretty busy, and I'll tell you a little bit more you know, about exactly the kind of sorts of areas we've been working on. But we've certainly done work this year on higher education, STEM, social pedagogy, uh, a whole host of, of different areas that we've been, we've been doing research and work in. And we find actually that career is a very useful concept that can sit at the heart of really a lot of different areas that, that we're interested in. And thankfully a number of other people are interested in as well. And the other thing I think we should say is that this year we've done really probably the, the most globe trotting that I think we've ever, ever managed to do as, as a centre. And, and that's something that's been, been steadily growing really, really for sort of the past five or six years. But, but this year some of us have been in Oh, where have we been? Uh, we've been in Tallinn, we've been in Italy, we've been in China, we've been in uh, Finland, we've been in, we've been, we've been all over, over the place. And, and obviously that's nice and you get to see some nice places, but I think what's been really interesting for us is getting these comparative perspectives on education and career development systems across the world and being able to see the ways in which people do things, the way in which uh, which they do things differently from the UK, the way in which they're, they're, they're further ahead, and the way in which they're perhaps not so far ahead at other times. And so obviously a lot of what we're doing, hopefully, is trying to draw together some of that expertise and, and help to spread it around a bit. So these are various people we've been working with. It's really just to give you an idea of the kind of range of, of different people who we've been, who've been funding our work and who we've been working with. And, uh, Again, it goes from the very, very local, so Derby City Council, right outside the door, through to doing, doing work for European Lifelong Guidance Policy Network and, and, and across Europe and so on. So, we, we, one of the other things we've done this year, we, it's, it's now our 15th year, as, as I said, or 15th year as a centre, and uh, we've, we've been uh, writing a, a history of the centre, which we'll hope to bring out early in, in the new year. But this quote that, that came out of it, I just thought it was quite nice because it, we were one of the things we asked people who were around at the beginning of the centre, what was it that, that, that you wanted to see from the centre? And this, this quote from Jean Pardo uh, says, just, I thought it summed it up quite nicely, really. It's, it's this thing about being able to base career's practice on, on an evidence base, really. And, and also, also to learn and have, have that kind of cycle of continuous improvement. So it's not simply, I think, with, with anything in education, but certainly in career, it's not something where we, we find out what's, what works and that's it, that's, the, that's the, the, the development done forever. It's an ongoing process. And I think ISEX, we have tried to play that role of walking alongside a number of the key players in career development throughout our history and try to be kind of very clear about how we provide that reflection, uh, input of theory, input of evidence and so on. 
And just, I, I just did a little exercise where I took all of our, our um, publications and put them into a, into a kind of mangling machine and uh, to see what, see what came out. And, and I mean, it's perhaps not, nothing tremendously surprising, but this, is, this gives you a sort of sense of the kind of areas that we've been working in. And I think what strikes me is, is it's, it's our, our belief, I think, is that careers is a lifelong process. It is something which happens right across the life course and which there are multiple players in it. So, uh, so it's something where the government's involved, business is involved, employers are involved, schools are involved, individuals are involved, and so on. And uh, we will be bringing out, as I say, our, uh, <coughs> our history of, that, of the centre, which should be out early, early next year. So, uh, so you'll, I, I dare say you'll all be, all be Reserving a place. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it out for the, for your Christmas stockings, but uh, it will be, you know, you can put it on your birthday present list for next year. Um, so this is what we're going to be doing today. We're just uh, really sort of handing over to Wendy in just a second, um, but then we will be having an, an opportunity for questions and discussions later on. And Tony uh, Watts will be chairing that. And so I, I thought I would just start by just introducing Wendy. Um, this is what she she told us about herself that she was voted the <laughs> third most influential. It's taped now. Was it? Oh, it's like, like, like top of the. <laughs> we like thirteenth because it had a sort of slightly. It has a nightly unlucky ring. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, I've been aware of, of, of Wendy's work for quite a long while. I think when you start to, as I've come from sort of being involved in delivery career development programs and start to get more interested in well, what's the theory and research and so on behind it, you start to look around and you look at who's been writing and you find a number of people, a number of whom are in the, in the room today. But Wendy is certainly one of them and one of the things that I've been interested in, my sort of background, was working with researchers in universities and looking at uh, how, do you, how do you support people who are on a career path, so not, not, not people who a student, the people who are on a career path, and perhaps are working for university. And a lot of what's written about careers is written, still comes from very much a school perspective, or it comes from a kind of unemployed worker perspective. And what I found when I first engaged with, with, with Wendy's work was it was really useful to have somebody who was thinking about how do you develop the careers of people who actually have quite a lot of skills, who actually have quite a lot to offer, who are established on a career path but may have to switch or may, have, may be looking for ways uh, to progress. What kind of support can you put in place for them? And so I mean, that was kind of how I first came across your work, I think. And I've then, as I've been, we've been I've described how we've been travelling quite a lot. Uh, as I travel around the world, I often will bump into people whose focus is in career coaching or working in organisations and I'll often say, oh, I've got a colleague at NYSEC. Um, I don't know whether you know her, and they'll always say, oh yes, we've had, we've had Wendy at our conference. Uh, she talks an awful lot of sense, but she certainly put the cat amongst the pigeons and, uh, and uh, got people talking. She was very controversial. And, and so uh, people know Wendy, I think, across the world, and they're, they're very, I think it's quite interesting that they both think she's controversial, but also tend to agree with what she says. <laughs> so, it seems, seems quite interesting to me, but um, I know that we're going to have a brilliant annual lecture today and so without really further ado I will hand over to Wendy and uh, and, and let you start off but well, thank you thank for coming. You, well I'm hoping this is going to work. It'd be good to know who's in the room so how many of you do career guidance? And all of those who don't, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Academics in the room? Yeah. Students in the room? Oh yeah, people who did. Yes, yes. yes. how many people who stopped doing it? <laughs> <laughs> I reckon when I retire is when I can really start doing all this stuff. Yeah, exactly right. um, so yes, so it's an honour and a great joy to be in Derby today. I must say it's a long way from home. I live right down in the deep south. And I'm always surprised how far the Midlands is. <laughs> so it's uh, it's really nice to got here and lovely to have such a. Uh, an exciting room full of people. Um, I seem to be incapable of reading from a script. I, I only really did it once, 
Um, a close colleague said I sounded like the Queen on a very bad day. <laughs> so I've never dared do it. This is like career advice. If someone says something to you once. Um, so I've got some notes and I've got some slides and I hope we'll make do. Um, I'm planning to go at a fair lick and then allow a really good chunk of time at the end. But if I talk nonsense, which is not unlikely, do stop me if I'm rattling and, you know, I'm not explaining. Do stop me. Every now and then I may ask you a question, and my questions are never rhetorical. I really want someone to say something, so we might do that. First problem, if you're left-handed, is getting the slide thing right. Let's see if that works. Yes. These are some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, I gave myself a funny title, Career Support for Grown-Ups. Um, one of the problems is we don't have anything we can call career, what is it? You can't talk to employers about career guidance, they think about marriage guidance. Um, Counselling is a funny word in the UK. Coaching means different things to different people. Some people don't like the word career support, they make it sound like people need patching up. Actually, of all the terms I've tried, it's the one that more people seem to understand. So I'm not using it for any complicated reason, just because um, by career support, I really mean all the things we might do to help people with their career development. And in particular, when you're looking at adults, it really is very largely not about career choices and career decisions or career plans. It's also about acting on those and there are lots of people who make, you know, don't worry so much about what they want to do, but, but the doing of it is very difficult when you're a grown-up. Um, and so um, the, the reason I use the term career support is to cover not just supporting people in their career choices and decisions, but very much in developing their careers then, in, in taking action. Grown-ups is obviously a rather silly term. I do mean adults, but I also mean... Supposing we were to be more grown up about this, what kinds of things would we do? If we recognise that adults want something adult, what would it look like? Um, career development is a sort of tiny profession. I shall play some games with numbers a bit later, perhaps. Or is it everyone's business? The business of business, the business of everyone that works, probably the business of all grown ups. Um, you might have your own answer to that question. I will probably come back to the question at the end um, because I'm serious about whether um, it really is everyone's business. Uh, when I'm thinking about grown-ups today, I'm definitely, as Tristram hinted, in a way the people I have in my mind, the ordinary working adults. Not particularly high skill, not particularly low skill, a vast range of kinds of jobs. They may be working part-time, they may be working full-time, they may be working for themselves. Um, but I'm not on the whole thinking today about people with extreme difficulties in employment because I have much less experience of working in that world. Although I will touch on a study of prisoners who turned out to be remarkably interesting in terms of their career choices. Um, so it's a bit like the ordinary child gets forgotten at school, the ordinary adult sort of completely absent from career guidance. It always seems to me. Um, where do my messages come from? Um, standing in a university, I'm always aware that my own evidence base is slightly ropey, really. I do research about half my time, and I advise employed organisations about half my time. And so my views tend to come from every now and then trying to do some fairly systematic work. But often from all the managers and employees I talk to all the time. Um, and the people in HR who are often my clients. Um, who are of all, you know, a, a wide scatter of people in the workplace. Union representatives too, of course. Um, so I think this talk is really only a connected set of experiences and ideas. It's not a heavily, a heavily academic um, input. Um, I do want to talk about um, why career development is an issue for grown-ups, but also for employers, and, and maybe point to some really interesting shifts going on, I think, with employers. I'm, I'm really interested for your views, <laughs> as well as mine, on what is it that individuals really want to talk about if they want to talk about career issues. Um, who do they talk to? Who could they talk to? 
Um, I will give you some thoughts about the kinds of different models employers have used if they do want to set up some slightly more substantial career support, usually in the workplace or through them. And then we'll come back to that question about is it a tiny professional or everyone's business or a bit of both. Does that sound okay? Anyone sleep yet? This was my mother's acid test. She was a polytechnic <laughs> lecturer. She never minded if they fell asleep, so residential social workers, she was thought like, having a nap in her class was reasonable. Um, <laughs> very humane woman, my mother. Um, I will just start with a bit of very recent research. This is a piece of work that the Institute for Employment Studies, an institute I've worked with and for for a long time, has just done for BIS. Uh, BIS said a very interesting exam question. Uh, they didn't want to be anything evaluated, change in government. They just said, so how do grown-ups make decisions then about their careers? If we want to think about how adults approach career decision-making, what do they do? Uh, and this is one of a couple of models that came out of the research, really just designed to map, in a way, the kinds of stuff people think about when they're thinking about their working lives. Does it all look fairly familiar to you? Can you see it at the back? Or not too easily? Well, I suppose what it struck, what struck me doing the work and putting this together, this is based on a, a study of very in-depth interviews, not with a huge sample, with 50 <coughs> adults, some of whom were picked up through the career service, and, and as many who weren't, and included a batch of prisoners that my colleague Lee Henderson uh, talked to, because the, the bit of government that's responsible for prisoners wanted to talk to people as well. And I suppose what struck me is we all know about all that stuff, but when people think about careers and when people talk to them, I suspect there are bits of that map that I'm more aware of than other bits, and there may be bits I forget. <coughs> One of the bits that came out really strongly in these long narrative interviews about decisions was the blue one in the top left-hand corner, um, very closely related to some of Jim Samson's work on psychological states. How am I feeling about myself generally in my life? And people in many different jobs with very differing skill levels and employment histories were so deeply coloured just by how they, how they were at that time. Does that resonate with you? And we think about that for people in difficulty, that this wasn't necessarily to do with particular difficulty. <coughs> how optimistic am I feeling, really? How up for stuff, generally? The stuff in the bottom left-hand corner was interesting in that when people were talking about how they saw their careers, it wasn't really about a career plan, it was sometimes about a career goal, but the term career <coughs> identity came a lot closer. So do you know the work of Amina Ibarra? Have you read that lovely book on career identity? If you haven't, I do recommend it. That thought about, well, who am I becoming in my working self, was much closer to how many of the people were thinking than this is my next step. Uh, and particularly so for the prisoners. What sort of person am I going to be when I, when I get out of here? Um, the other stuff perhaps was more expected. The yellow bits on that diagram aren't just there because yellow and blue is kind of different. The yellow bits are sort of the opportunities <coughs> and constraints part of people's pictures. Um, and interesting stuff there, I think particularly on the middle on the right, <coughs> that really understanding the labour market loomed enormous for all the people in this study. And even people of very high levels of skill and with very, uh, you know, interesting careers still felt they needed to keep on top of what was happening and that may be happening in their field or happening in a field they're thinking of being interested in that they don't know about. And I just wonder sometimes if the whole world of career guidance really acknowledges just how big that is. Do you think we really do? That business of understanding what's out there. Uh, they actually <coughs> talked as much, if not more than that, uh, uh, than the stuff that's in here. So there's the stuff out there and the stuff that's in here. The stuff out there is really hard for people. Really, really hard for people. <coughs> uh, but here are just a 
few. Um, I don't know if they're easy to read. I'll read them for you because at the back it might not be easy. But just to point up some of those features, really. This is a, an unemployed, not particularly well qualified young person. I worked in two cafes. I was a care worker. I was working in a housing association. I worked in a pizza shop. They're not all the same jobs. It's just any job that comes up. I was just applying for any, just to get a job. And just really, it was for my mum to say, yes, I'm actually doing something with my life. That was not that uncommon a kind of person. The next one is someone being really quite strategic about their career, but not in an orthodox way. After six months of the news agent thing, I started doing cleaning jobs because I knew why I was doing it. I was supporting the music again. This is a budding rock star. Having to do stuff that you basically don't have to be educated for, I needed it at that time to be part-time. I needed it to be a bit flexible, so I was fitting stuff around music, which I'm still doing. So that sort of way that people are managing their working lives. The last person was a, a, a woman thinking of going back to work, uh, who interestingly looked at what she could do with a PhD and then decided she didn't really want to do it. I do feel there was a bit in the middle of my career where I drifted a bit doing my PhD and things. It was nice, it was enjoyable at the time, but I wasn't thinking of any longer term. Now in some ways, I want to be in something for the next 20 years, which I don't think I've ever done before. And what would I like to be in for 20 years? Helping people where I can with something that I know I can do and something I'll actually enjoy doing. And although obviously each story is unique to a person, that was such a recurring theme. That feeling, and it occurred at different life stages for different people, of, of wanting to do something for quite a while, but something you might actually really want to do. So all this stuff in women's magazines about portfolio workers, blah, 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 it, it's not necessarily that close to, to how people think about their lives. Does that make sense to you? Familiar sorts of stories? Obviously, every person's different, but some of those themes um, came out very strongly, and that's where that... that, that